We're going to go ahead and kick off our keynote, our luncheon keynote. I have to admit, before I jump into introductions here, um, you know, our keynote today has really been an incredible champion uh, for well-being um, and health and wellness on our campuses nationwide and really leading through example. And so it's a real delight to, to be able to have him here today with us. Uh, for close to four decades, uh, uh, John DeGoya has helped, uh, known as Jack, has helped to define and strengthen Georgetown University as, a, as an institution of education and research. A Georgetown alumnus, Dr. DeGoya served as senior administrator and as a faculty member in the Department of Philosophy before becoming Georgetown's 48th president in 2001. Please uh, join me in welcoming Jack up to the podium here. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Let me just, does that work okay? Beautiful. Well, I wish to express my appreciation to Devin for this invitation and the opportunity to join you for this, this convening. And it's an honor to be with you today and to offer these, these brief reflections. And I'm humbled to be here with so many colleagues who are at the front lines of responding to the difficulties facing our young people in the context of a moment in our society that we are seeking to interpret. And I offer these reflections from the perspective of four decades of engagement with the work of student well-being. I've lived my life since I was 18 years of age, just up the street in the context of one academic community, Georgetown University, including service early in my years as our Chief Student Affairs Officer. It would be presumptuous of me to try to suggest to all of you how best to manage the immediate challenges of building a culture of campus well-being. I work closely with our team at Georgetown and I'm aware of the limits of the position that I currently occupy and contributing to the immediacy of this moment. What I hope I can do in these reflections is to place the work in which we are engaged in the context of the mission and purpose of our colleges and universities. We are often maligned in the literature that's produced to highlight our shortcomings. There's an ongoing cottage in industry of critical reviews of the academy. But for every critical review, there are efforts to remind us of our purpose in society, and I hope to tap into the spirit of these efforts. Colleagues like Martha Nussbaum and Julie Rubin and Stefan Collini, Chad Wellman, Andrew Jewett, William Clark, have provided resources to us to gird us in the battle for the soul of the academy. I'll begin with reflections on the demands on all of us, demands we all share in this moment, these, command, these demands can become so preoccupying that we can lose our way, forgetting the distinctive role our colleges and universities play in our society. I'd like to bring us back to the foundational elements of the academy. As we contemplate well-being, we remember that our aim is more than coping with the challenges facing our young people. We seek the cultivation of individual authenticity. Well-being is not the mere opposite of mental health issues. It is rather the presence of the search for authenticity, the pursuit of interior freedom in the lives of each of our young people, a pursuit that will enable each of them to identify the conditions to enable flourishing. A culture of campus well-being must be based on the mission and purpose of our colleges and universities, on the work in which we are collectively engaged. And I'll conclude with a sense of hope. We are alive at a time when the most extraordinary work is being done to support us in our work, work in which all of you are engaged, work that calls for a new kind of commitment from the academy. So first, is there something distinctive about this moment? We know we are seeing 
higher prevalence of threats to student well-being. Depression is on the rise with the most rapid increase seen in young people. Anxiety and depression are the most common presenting concerns and are the only presenting concerns that have demonstrated a clear growth trend over the past four years. One in five adolescents have a mental illness that will persist into adulthood. Among teenagers and young adults, age 15 to 24, suicide was the second leading cause of death, highest in males. And we know there are new ways of understanding, framing, of interpreting our reality. Developments over the past quarter century in our understanding of the brain provide the insight regarding the trajectory of biological development. From colleagues, including Jay Geed and Francis Jensen, we know the frontal lobe is still in the process of development throughout one's 20s. Gene Twenge has introduced us to the dangers of the ubiquity of connectedness through technology. You know I have a Georgetown parent in the room, a Hoya dad. This is not going to be the easiest fact to share with you. Um, but the average age, and this comes out of one of our, our study centers, the Center for Education and the Workforce, the average age of financial independence in a full employment society is 31 years of age and growing. And as Malcolm Harris has illuminated, there are impacts for young people whose self-identity is as human capital. Now, an advantage of 40 years of engagement is the memory of our journey. When I began, we oriented ourselves to the prism of child and adolescent development, through the models offered by Piaget and Erickson, through Kohlberg and later Carol Gilligan. The field of student affairs emerged with foundations provided by pioneers like William Perry at Harvard, Lee Neffelkamp at Maryland, ACHA's own Richard Keeling. Developments in psychopharmacology, the introduction of Prozac in 1987, and the 1990s, the ADHD drugs, Ritalin and Adderall. The ability to provide for the continuing academic progress of young people who a generation earlier would not have found their way to our campuses have all contributed to the present moment. As I'll describe in a few moments, we're also the beneficiaries of extraordinary new work by colleagues like Corey Keyes and Martin Seligman and Carol Dweck and Angela Duck Duckworth, new bodies of work that we can draw upon in responding to the realities of this moment. So it isn't just such a moment that I believe it is imperative for us to retrieve an understanding of our mission our purpose, and to recommit ourselves to the role that we play in society. Three elements shape the university, its purpose and values, and these have defined our identities for the past millennia. We support the formation of young people. We support the inquiry, the scholarship and research of our faculty. And we as institutions contribute to the common good of the communities in which we participate. Formation, inquiry, common good. These three elements are mutually reinforcing, inextricably linked, and cannot be unbundled without risking irreparable damage to the enterprise. The element of the academy most relevant for this convening is the work of formation. Formation can occur and has occurred in many different settings, in a religious order, in military training, in an entrepreneurial venture, and so on. What distinguishes the university in this work of formation is the central place of an emphasis on knowledge. Particularly salient is the accumulation of that knowledge and how that understanding of the accumulation 
of knowledge contributes to our understanding of our world, of the world we live in now. We believe the acquisition and dissemination, the discovery and construction, the interpretation and conservation of knowledge determine the orientation of the university. It is what we do. It is what we contribute to the students who weave in and out into the larger environments that we're situated in. We introduce students to disciplines and methodologies for engaging in the work of knowing. This commitment to knowledge differentiates the university from other settings where formation is also present. It makes the free inquiry of knowledge an essential feature of the work of formation. Moreover, universities provide a place for protecting and nurturing resources of incomparable value for deepening self-awareness, self-understanding, self-knowledge, resources that support the interior work of making meaning in one's life. We seek to provide a context for our students to become their most authentic selves. Charles Taylor finds this idea of authenticity captured in Herder's idea, quote, that each of us has an original way of being human, close quote. Such a goal can only be attained through demanding interior work. An authentic self is one living in accord with one's most deeply held values when capable of resisting the forces of darkness that are always pulling one away from the goods that enable us to realize our full promise. Our decisions and our actions are informed by these values, these goods. We seek alignment between these goods and our decisions and actions. As Taylor writes, there's a certain way of being human that is my way. All of us struggle to align our decisions and actions with the deepest goods that animate our lives. Too often, we lack an interior freedom that enable us to break through the blocks to authenticity. It is a critical mission of the university to enable an authentic self to emerge and to enable that authentic self through what we introduce within the university to flourish. How do we understand the nature of the interior lives, the integrity of the interiority of our young people? How are they making sense of our world? What effect do new technologies of connecting with one another, of social networking, of Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, what effect do they have on their ways of making meaning in their lives? How are their imaginations being formed and how do they understand the depth and breadth of their possibilities? This is the work of colleges and universities. It can't get lost in the midst of the chaos and confusion of our Twitter feeds, of our 24-hour news cycles, of unprecedented demand for counseling services. It can be difficult to recall the moral impetus that drew all of us into this work at a time in our lives when we were searching for a vocation to sustain our own sense of meaning in our lives. At our moment, when our young people are negotiating their personal journeys of authenticity, the contours of their identities, and the turbulence of these early years of this new century, it is urgent that we recommit ourselves to the distinctive responsibilities we share to the work of formation that can only take place on the campuses of our colleges and universities. I hope you can sense 
in, in, the, in the way in which I'm trying to share these reflections, the hope that I have for our colleges and universities in this moment. Never have we been more relevant. Never have we been more needed. This is a moment that demands the very best of the academy, and we must respond with all of the resources available to us. I began by identifying those who are making incalculable contributions to strengthening the range of responses. Let me extend these introductory comments further. Consider some of the resources that have, that have become available to us during the arc of, of our careers. Martin Seligman and the developments of positive psychology, all of the work that has emerged in the field of happiness. Mihal Csikszentmihalyi and his work on flow. Sherry Gleed on acknowledging our public responsibilities for one another. Jean Twenge on the unfolding impact of our new devices, our expanded connectivity. Francis Jensen and Jay Geed on the neuroscience of adolescence. Tom Insell, former director of, of NIMH and his efforts to harness technology to support mental health. Carol Dweck, who's done so much to strengthen our understanding of the importance of a growth mindset. Angela Duckworth and our understanding of resilience. Nancy Macchiel on the journey that opened our academic communities to all of our young people. Claude Steele on creating the conditions for inclusion, for belonging, for an unprecedented diversity on our campuses. Brian Hainline, the first chief medical officer of the NCAA, focusing attention on mind, body, and sport. These are just a few of the women and men who have embraced this moment and are developing capacities to ensure that we can provide the strongest possible framework for the work of formation for our young people. I'd like to draw special attention to the contributions of Professor Corey Keyes of Emory, who's enabled us to understand the correlates of flourishing and languishing. While the challenges perhaps have never been greater, the resources available to us are extraordinary, equal to the tasks before us. There has never been a better moment for us to embrace the work that we are called to do. I know we all share the burden of determining how we can best harness these resources. We are all confronted with insufficient financial resources to meet, to meet the demands for our services. But here too, we just might be able to do our very best work. This is a moment that demands new models for services. In the 1980s, we introduced models that sought to address immediate needs in our communities. Quick assessment, prescribed lengths for the services that we could provide. Today, these models are coming under increased pressure. In 1963, President Kennedy signed into law the Community Mental Health Act, a moment of great idealism and imagining the partnership between mental health practitioners and institutions and with unprecedented support from the federal government. The idealism of that moment came under stress during the next decades and was never realized. The promise of community mental health needs to be recaptured, the vision reimagined. Where can this work be better engaged? This work of reimagining what a model for community mental health might look like, where can this work be better engaged than in the context of our campus communities? There is a noble calling that each of you has responded to. This is what places you here in this room at this time. This is the calling that we need to recommit ourselves to in this moment. Let's recapture what Dr. Perry understood 50 years ago. In 1968, he published Forms of Ethical and Intellectual Development in the College Years. 
Let's remember the wisdom captured in pioneering work like identity and the life cycle or in a different voice. Let us remember the arc of contributions of the American College Health Association. Since its founding in 1920, the launch of the National College Health Assessment in 2000. Let us capture the idealism of the period that produced the Community Mental Health Act. Let's draw from the work on happiness, on grit, on flow, on mindset, on flourishing. This is a moment that demands the very best of us. Let us all prove worthy of this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really wonderful um, uh, keynote. We have a few minutes, actually. Um, I think your schedule permits for a couple questions. Absolutely. Perfect. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? I can run a mic around if we have any. I know everybody's got at least a few in their minds. Right, let me ask one from you, Jack. In ahead, term, as you engage within your greater community, or, or maybe it's recommendations for other colleges, I mean, how do you, as, as the leader of the university, engage your community and your board of regents to start kind of, uh, I guess, advancing this further within uh, the context of all the other competing demands that you have? Sure. Well, you know, I had the advantage. At my, my first sort of uh, formal position in, in the administration in 1985. Um, and I served in the role for seven years, was serving as our, our chief student affairs officer. Uh, our counseling and psychiatric services reported up to me, student health reported up, athletics, the police department. It was the, you know, as uh, Anthony Quinn said in Zorba the Greek, it was the total catastrophe, the full catastrophe. <laughs> I had it all. I was relatively young, as you probably can figure out at the time. Uh, so that was, you know, 33 years ago. Um, I didn't know better than to tell everybody that I knew exactly what I was learning. And so there was never a, a, a sort of predisposition to tamp down the realities of day-to-day of -day campus life. So, you know, as I was welcoming new parents in the mid-'80s, I'd tell the truth. This is what we confront every day here. And contrary to what I think was expected, that dynamic of telling the, telling the, the realities of what we confront every day was viewed as uh, was reassuring. Because it, it was really the, 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 that sort of pretense that it, there, there was a different kind of reality going on. Everybody knows what we wrestle with. But if we aren't honest with ourselves, we, we, we block our ability to do our very best work. So I think I kind of got lucky that I started and I didn't know any better, that I, I, maybe I wasn't supposed to talk like that um, so, so bluntly about the realities of, of, of campus life. But because I got comfortable with it and, I, and it worked in terms of a, an authentic framework for us to engage in, in, in our work, um, as I've moved on, and I've been, I've been succeeded now by three different um, vice presidents for student affairs since 92, um, that sort of spirit has, has really animated our work. And so I, I think there's, there is an integrity to engaging the work that really seeks to uh, you know, we sort of try to subordinate to the biggest challenges that we face. And, and I think my colleagues are used to me saying this because I, I kind of say this almost every day. Whatever you might be wrestling with, imagine the worst thing happens today. What would you do tomorrow? Let's do it today. And trying to then harness the resources in this moment, that's been our, our and this is our biggest challenge. And like all of you, we're wrestling with a, a set of demands and a need to respond in a way that, that is equal to the challenge. Thanks. So 
My guess is there's not a lot of college presidents who necessarily came up through chief of student affairs divisions. Um, so what advice do you give or how can you help us think about how best to engage college presidents in this work who are not steeped in the knowledge and understanding that you perhaps have benefited from? It's a great question. I, I do feel incredibly fortunate that this was by no means intentional and I think everybody who, who if you ever talk to anybody about my story at Georgetown, there's no part of it that is not an anomaly. So that, that I was able to step into that role in 1985 was, was a great gift. And I, I, I think what it provided for me always was, was a sense of what, what was going on on the campus. I, I wouldn't, today I would not know all the details like I might have. And there are moments when, I, I, you know, that we have one residence hall that, that is on a hill uh, down from my office. And on a Friday evening at about 6 o'clock, you, know, you can just feel it pulsating. And, and I remind myself, this is part of our charm. This is, we're a residential community. And, and, and we just want to get through each night. It's uh, one at a time. You know, I, I, all, all of my colleagues that, that I've had the privilege to work with um, who serve in these roles across higher education, they, the, m you're quite right, very, very few have had the kind of immersion in community life and often they bring their own undergraduate experience as their benchmark. Uh, and that's probably not the, the, the most helpful because it really is an understanding the full breadth of, of what we what we engage every day. Um, you know, I, I, th this, was, this was one piece that worked for me that I would just share that, that might, might be helpful. I, we just celebrated the 50th year on Friday night of our Community Scholars Program, which was our bridge program that began in 1968 to really open up to, to equal opportunity. And we had a whole, we had people back from all 50 years. One of, the, one of the folks who came back was a retired member of our faculty who, was, I was an undergraduate English major. I didn't have her in class because I just didn't get lucky enough. But she was a legend in our English department and was a real champion through all the years of, of building up this program. And I remember it was sort of, I'm gonna say it was 1988, and she had done one of, one of, her, one of her undergraduate courses, had focused on, on the literature of interiority, but focused especially for young women, and especially, a special segment was on eating disorders. I had no framework to understand, and this was relatively early in terms of our university's, you know, the capacity. We, we, as a result of her sharing with me the essays of her students in the class, that led us, led me to actually hire our first time health educator focused on eating disorders. And it was a time when it was really, we were just beginning to get our head around how challenging this issue, this issue could be. And I guess what I'd say is, I was, um, I had come out of the residence halls. That's what I had done before. Uh, my, my qualifications had been I had been chief of staff to the president for a few years. I was an RA and an R, I was a resident hall director. So I did about almost six years in the residence halls while I was working on my PhD. And the truth be told, I was still a graduate student when I was chief of student affairs. We didn't advertise that very widely. But, <laughs> uh, but, but it got embarrassing at one point. I went to, you know, because I was a graduate student, I went to student health for my health care. And it reported to me. And I remember going, but, <laughs> My first year, I was having stomach, stomach troubles. And I, I said, well, let me go see my doctor while my doctor was. So, he, you know, all the embarrassing things you have to do when you have, have to check out whether you have any problem with your stomach. And when, when I finished, my doctor said to me, listen, we've got to change this relationship. He said, <laughs> he said I may be the cause of this stomach problem. Not, so we changed it. But, but what, what I'd say is... Um, I, I was relatively young and sort of immersed in the culture that our students were coming, coming into, and, and that gave me some advantages. But when a colleague 
shared, shared with me a set of essays that were so searing to read. It, it had, had a real profound impact on me. And I think anything that you can do to enable the, the senior leadership to, to get that affect about what our students are wrestling with. I mean, it can, it can really look like just another problem, another resource allocation problem for a senior leadership team. But if, if they can understand at, in their gut what it's like for our young people to be living through this moment, as I said in my opening word, the, a moment we're really trying to interpret right now. We don't know what to fully say about what they're going to write about this a generation or two generations from now. But if we can get, get that feeling in, in there, you know, have it to be an affective experience, I think is the most valuable thing we can provide to our colleagues. Thank All you. right, thank you very much, President DeGoya. Sure, I appreciate sure, your wonderful sure. keynote.